moment. Oh, it's so good to see you. So good to um, be reminded of God's love for us. Wow. Um, we're going to carry on doing that as we open God's Word this morning. Um, can I invite you, if you have a Bible with you this morning, to turn to Luke chapter 6. We're continuing our series uh, at present in the Gospel of Luke. And we come this morning to Luke 6, verses 1 to 11. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, that's absolutely fine, but if you have one, do look for Luke 6, and we'll read it in just a few moments. But first, I wanted to start with this. A study conducted online just a few years ago amongst uh, adults um, across 23 different countries found a split almost precisely down the middle around the following statement. Religion does more harm than good. Religion does more harm than good. And in this survey... 49% agreed with that sentiment, and 51% disagreed. Now, in our own nation, in our own Western culture, the split of opinion is much less even, with around two-thirds to three-quarters of people now believing that religion does more harm than good. And then, of course, we get prominent celebrity atheists who like to chip in, uh, like one who stated that religion is the most prolific source of violence in our history, and another who declared... There's no doubt that throughout history, religious faith has been a major motivator for war and for destruction. Uh, now, I'm not here this morning to debate statistics, although the records actually show that only about 6 or 7% of wars throughout history have been a, around religion. But I'm not going to pretend that there haven't also been people, perhaps many people at times, who even called themselves Christians, who started wars or used their religion as a club to harm other people rather than help them. Sadly, any belief system, including Christianity, can be twisted and misused by sinful people to harm others. But the question I believe our passage this morning addresses is, is genuine Christianity, the undistorted, undiluted biblical Christian faith, is it intended by God for our harm or for our good? Did Jesus come to harm us or to help us? Did he come to subjugate us or to serve us? Did he come to place a greater burden upon our backs or to remove our greatest burden entirely? Our passage this morning presents us with two very different ideas of God and what it looks like to follow him, two very different ideas of what life is meant to be like when we know and worship him, but only one of these views is true. Only one of them reflects God's heart towards men. And the other view we're going to find here is a man-made distortion, and it's a lie that is deadly. And this morning we're going to find out, if we need to, which is which. But more than that, as we unpack this passage, I do believe the Holy Spirit this morning, through God's Word, through His Word, intends to probe and challenge each one of us as to which of these views of God... And which of these views of the gospel we really believe and live in the good of and live out in practice each day. So let's, let's turn together now. Let's read God's life-giving and uh, glorious, faithful, all-sufficient word. Luke chapter 6, verse 1. On a Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath? to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it. And after looking around at them, after looking around at them all, he said to him, 
stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. I just have two simple headings to help us this morning. The first is this. Jesus declares he is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, like last week, our passage begins with a conflict, another conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the kind of most revered uh, Jewish religious leaders and teachers of the day. And like, well, last week, the conflict surrounded the rightness of fasting versus feasting, if you were here and remember that. This week, the conflict shifts to this question about what is right behavior on the Sabbath. But as we're about to see, beneath the surface, these two conflicts, last week and this week, they're really about the same thing. We have the goodness of grace versus the misery of legalism. The goodness of God versus the misery of man-made religion. And it all begins in a grain field. So here we have Jesus and his disciples walking through the grain field, through a field of grain together on the Sabbath. And as they're walking along, uh, maybe talking, enjoying time together, the disciples are plucking some of the grain and snacking on some of the grain heads. And the Pharisees, seeing this, and you have to wonder if they were actually lying in wait. They're like the the Sabbath police, the undercover Sabbath police, watching and waiting. They accuse Jesus and his disciples of doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, the the first thing we have to realize here is that walking through another person's grain field, because you might be getting worried and you might be thinking, well, if someone walks through my garden and through my vegetable patch, I'm not too pleased if they just start pulling food. Uh, But... To walk through another person's grain field and snack on some of the grain was actually entirely lawful according to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 23 made allowance for precisely this kind of need, the everyday need of hungry and needy neighbors and travelers. Deuteronomy 23:24 says, If you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Uh, So you couldn't go into your neighbor's field with a combine harvester and do a full-scale harvest of their corn. You couldn't start bagging up their produce to take home, but you could certainly take what you needed to eat there and then to fill your stomach if you were hungry. Uh, This is just one of the many provisions in the law of God that reflects God's heart to provide for the poor and the needy. God's heart, his passion, is to do good and show mercy and act with kindness and generosity. This is God's heart. But the Pharisees aren't operating with anything like those kind of heart priorities. All they care about and what they are intensely hung up about is that Jesus and his friends might be breaking their own self-imposed man-made rules about the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, of course, was a day of rest. So it's not that God says, has said nothing about the Sabbath. It's the fourth of the Ten Commandments, and, and it, the, the fourth of the Ten Commandments does indeed prohibit work on the Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 8, God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So that is God's word, God's Old Testament law. The problem is that over time, as we saw last week, The Jewish religious leaders did what they seemed to be very good at doing. They always did this best. They added many of their own rules and restrictions on top of what God had said. They added 39 different elaborate categories of rules just to what God had said about the Sabbath alone. 39 different categories of activity that were now expressly forbidden by them for everyone on the Sabbath. And each of those categories had various subcategories and clauses they were always adding. So they said, for instance, uh, that it would be a sin on the Sabbath to untie a knot. Okay, that would be working on the Sabbath. 
So you imagine trying to go for a walk on the Sabbath, but you can't untie your shoelace. Uh, but not a problem, really, because they said you couldn't walk far anyway. Only five-eighths of a mile from your house and no further. Unless, actually, the night before, the day before, you took like a chair from your house and you went, f- you went five-eighths of a mile and you put it somewhere uh, and then you went home and the next day you could walk to the chair and that was like your second home and then you could go another five-eighths of a mile from there. So they thought these things through. Uh, you were allowed to sew on the Sabbath, but only one stitch. You could write a letter on the Sabbath, but just one letter, not two, so choose wisely. And with regard to medicine, you could help a person if their condition was really life-threatening, but if they were in an accident where they merely broke a limb, you weren't allowed to treat it or put a splint on it until the Sabbath day was over. Now remember, these are man-made rules, not things God had set. And here now, to their very narrow, legalistic, fault-finding, hair-splitting eyes, they determine that Jesus and his disciples, as they walk through this cornfield, are working on the Sabbath. They decide they're not just plucking a few heads of grain. Oh, no, they are reaping. And they're not just rubbing them together in their hands. Oh, no, they're threshing and winnowing. And they aren't just eating a few heads of grain. No, they are preparing food on the Sabbath. Right here, then, we have, a, we have a clear and miserable window into the legalistic heart. And we see one of its many great dangers. That not only does the legalistic heart confuse and obscure what God has really said and what he hasn't said, but the legalistic heart all, almost always seeks to impose burdens on other people rather than relieve them of them. As Jesus says of the Pharisees elsewhere, Matthew 23, verse 4, he says of the Pharisees, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. That is the calling card of the Pharisees and of the legalist, to want to make life harder and more wearying for the people around them, because that's their idea of God. And that's their idea of religion. But it's the very opposite of God's heart, which is to relieve people of their burdens. And it's to make this point that Jesus then points to a particular incident in the life of King David. Uh, So he points them to a bit of history they would know. He points them to a well-known occasion in 1 Samuel 21 when David, the future king, is on the run from the present king, King Saul. And on this occasion, David and his men are desperate and famished and fleeing and taking refuge in the temple. David begs Ahimelech the priest for some bread. They're starving. We need some bread. Unfortunately, there isn't any bread for them except for the consecrated bread, also known, Jesus calls it here, the the bread of the presence. And technically, this bread was only lawful for the priests to eat. Technically, for David and his men, even though they're starving, technically, to eat this bread would be a violation of the ceremonial law laid out, actually, by God himself in Leviticus. But Ahimelech the priest, recognizing that there is a tension now of priorities here, and understanding that human need matters more to God than mere religious ceremony, He goes ahead and gives the bread to David and his men, and they feasted on it, and no crime or sin was committed. Here's here's the point that Jesus is making in telling this story. In God's eyes, human need always trumps religious ritual. Human need always matters more than mere religious ritual. Even when, in some rare occasions, that ritual was given by God, as in the case of David. But a million times more so when that ritual has just been made up by human beings in the first place, as is the case with the Pharisees accusing the disciples. God's heart has always been plain on this matter. Okay, this is not even just a New Testament thing. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, God's heart never changes. And he says there, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The Pharisees care about religiosity and ritual far more than they care about mercy and love for people. But God cares far more deeply about mercy and love for people. He cares most deeply of all about people and their ultimate well-being. 
And this, as Jesus is about to demonstrate in the second half of this morning's passage, has always been the true purpose and intention of the Sabbath as well. So we'll get there in a moment. But first, Jesus then unashamedly makes this statement about himself at the close of this Old Testament story. He turns to them now, telling, having told the story, and he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I'd really like us to come more fully back to that statement a bit later on towards the end. But, but notice just for now, in stating this, Jesus is throwing down the gauntlet and challenging the Pharisees' perceived right to determine the rules about things. They think they have the right to interpret what God has said and add to what God has said or even ignore and distort what God has said so as to place more burdens and restrictions on people all in the name of piety and religion. And Jesus here turns to them and says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I am Lord of the Sabbath. Meaning I am the author and the maker and the giver of this day. And it is not for you to tell me what's allowed and what's okay. The irony here is staggering, of course. If only they could see it. If only they could see what is right before them. The Pharisees, blinded by their own self-righteousness and blinded by their own obsession with making more and more rules and restrictions, are arguing about the Sabbath with the Lord of the Sabbath himself. With the very one who knows firsthand what this Sabbath is really all about, what it's for, because he is its Lord and maker. And essentially what Jesus is saying here is I'm not going to go along one bit with your erroneous and oppressive view of things. But not only does he say it, he also then secondly this morning demonstrates it. So our second of two headings this morning, Jesus demonstrates he is Lord of the Sabbath. This is verses 6 to 11. Let's just read verses 6 and 7 again. On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Here we see again what is going on in the Pharisees' minds and hearts, where their focus, their only concern is with accusing Jesus and protecting their own positions and protecting their own legalistic practices. And according once again to their man-made traditions, no healing was allowed on the Sabbath. To heal, they said, was to practice medicine, and no one, they said, was allowed to practice their profession on the Sabbath, so there would be no healing on the Sabbath. Even so, and I was thinking about this this week, thinking about this this week, we, we might still wonder, you think, can't they see the very real human need in front of them? We can all be a bit uncaring and callous at times, but when you see a person in front of you with a with an injury or a serious need, Even then we think our our hearts, they tend to soften, don't they? Can't can't the Pharisees see what's going on in front of them? Here is a man with a withered hand, a fellow human being made in God's image, experiencing pain and suffering. We might think surely even they could be moved by this. But it doesn't matter to them. They're just circling like a pack of wolves with bated breath, just hoping that Jesus might walk into the trap they've laid for him. Again, this right here is their version of religion. This is man's version of God and religion. Maybe you're here this morning and you've said to yourself before, perhaps once or many times, I don't like religion, I don't like Christianity, I don't like God. I wonder if it's this picture of God and religion and Christianity in particular that you don't like because let me tell you that is not true biblical Christianity that's what we're seeing unfold here this is their version but Jesus knows what they're thinking and rather than putting off doing the right thing until he doesn't have this hostile audience around him he instead asks the man to come and stand right in the middle okay he wants everybody to see come and stand right in the midst of us And I wonder, maybe you found yourself in situations like this. Situations where you knew what the right thing to do was, but you also knew there were people watching who would mock you or scorn you, or maybe something worse, if they see you do this good thing. Maybe it was something as simple as knowing you ought to excuse yourself from a conversation that's turned to gossip. Or perhaps it's standing up for a person being bullied, 
or perhaps it's speaking up about Jesus, to do good to those listening, even though it might be those very same people who will reject you for what you share with them. Jesus is our model here, and he's also our perfect substitute when we fail. Never once did he back down from doing what was good and right and necessary. Never once did he delay. And here he wants them all to see, in fact, that what he's about to do for this man, he wants them to see what he's going to do for this man on the Sabbath. And so with this man standing right there in the middle, Jesus turns and looks first at the religious leaders and poses what what has to be this morning, the million-dollar question. I should say the million-pound question. Verse 9, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? Here, I think, is a question deliberately designed to plumb even the icy depths of the cold hearts of the Pharisees. Again, this is, this is a challenge, but it's mercy from Jesus. He's trying to get through to them. And he leaves them actually with no fence to sit on here, no neutral ground to hide in. It's an either-or question. Whatever their answer, it'll reveal what they really think God is like and what they really think the Sabbath and all of God's intentions for his people are like. But they do the only thing they can do for now to escape the question. They say nothing. Although they're going to show their true colors in just a couple of verses. But, but they're in the silence, no answer from them. Jesus turns and says now to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. And then Luke tells us, and he did so, and his hand was restored. And honestly, I think at this point, we've just got to say, let's forget about the Pharisees for the moment. We don't want to be distracted by them. Let's just marvel at what Jesus has done here. Here is a man whose hand is shriveled and shrunken and atrophied. We don't know how it happened. We don't know how long this has been. Likely, perhaps, he's lived his whole life like this. He can't do anything with this hand. He can't use it for much at all. He certainly can't stretch out his hand like I'm doing right now. So what does Jesus say to him? Stretch out your hand. Now, honestly, this is the kind of thing that I will blurt out by accident to someone with a bad hand and then feel really bad uh, feel real, real embarrassment. I can't believe I just asked this person with a withered hand to stretch out and, you know, pick that thing up for me or help me. You just, I didn't notice, and this is really, uh, I wasn't thinking. But Jesus doesn't say this, of course, by accident. On the contrary, he says it intentionally. Stretch out your hand. And what does the man with the withered, unstretchable hand do? He stretches out his hand. His hand literally comes to life in front of all of these witnesses. One minute it's hanging limply at his side. The next minute it's reaching out healed and whole and strong, proving that even the very words of Jesus, even the very voice of the Lord of the Sabbath has this life-giving power. Just imagine being a witness to this. This, this is the heart and the mission of Jesus on full display here, to see with their very eyes. It is to do good and not harm. It is to save life and not destroy it, which leads us back again then to that striking claim in verse 5, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, we've already said that that was Jesus telling them who gets to be the true determiner of the Sabbath's purpose, of Christianity's purpose. God gets to determine it, not man. Jesus gets to say what is true and right. And at this point in in Mark's gospel, as a sort of parallel passage, Jesus makes the point even clearer when he says, Mark 2 verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. Meaning the Sabbath was designed by God and intended by God to be something that served man and helped him and never something that burdened him. It was a gift of God for man's well-being. A day of rest in the midst of a tiring and restless world. In the same way God gives all of his laws and promises. And most of all, he gives Christ himself to us for our ultimate well-being and human flourishing and eternal good. Not to burden us, but to bring relief to us. But there's something else here 
that Jesus is claiming as well when he calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. Not just that he's the true authority on it, but that he's also the one the Sabbath points to. He is the living, breathing fulfillment of all that the Sabbath promised. The Sabbath was given by God to his people for relief and rest. But it was also a pointer beyond itself to a far greater, better, and more lasting rest to come, a more lasting spiritual rest. And now the man standing right in front of the Pharisees in the grain field and then in the synagogue, if only they could humble themselves enough to see it, is the very one who can give them this eternal Sabbath rest. He offers it freely to all who are willing to come to him. To all who are willing to turn from trusting in themselves and trusting in their own efforts and trusting in their own ideas of religion and instead put their trust wholly and solely in him and his finished work, his life, his death, his resurrection. Man-made religion. This this morning, if if we go away with nothing else, man-made religion and self-reliance and legalism only ever leads to more and more burdens. It only ever leads people further from God and more crushed beneath the weight of religious demands and religious expectations. But Jesus says to every kind of sinner, even the worst of sinners, be they a tax collector, a prostitute, or a religious leader, sometimes they're the worst of sinners. It's what Jesus says, following the words of Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And the first question this poses then, I think, to us this morning, is, is this your understanding of Christianity? Is this your understanding of what God is really like? Did you know that he was this good? Does your understanding match up with what he himself has actually said about himself in his word, in this book? Or are you still currently going through life, operating with and relying upon the shaky and unreliable teaching and traditions of men, whoever they might be, whether you've been taught to believe in a false version of this God or to trust in another God or to believe in no God but yourself? Have you taken the time to consider carefully what the true God has really said about himself in his word? And let me tell you this morning, nowhere does he reveal himself more clearly, he says this himself, nowhere does he reveal himself more clearly than in Jesus, Jesus Christ, his own son. Now the second question that follows the first is this, have you then actually, if you've seen that, have you turned to Jesus to receive the pardon and the forgiveness and the rest that God sent his son into the world through his life, death, and resurrection to give. Jesus really does supply and offer in his person everything that the Sabbath foreshadowed. Everything that it pointed forward to in in, in miniature, shadowy form, Jesus fulfills that, but a million times bigger and better. He offers true and lasting peace and spiritual rest, restoration and relationship with God, not to mention the forgiveness of your sins, the hope of heaven and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus graciously offers and gives all these things and more to those who turn and put their trust in him and in his sin-atoning death. Have you personally responded yet like this? Put your trust in him and receive this rest for yourself. Because Sadly, as freely offered as it is, it is not something anyone just receives by default. No one is born a Christian or even just becomes one by coming to church and hearing the message. We have to hear and believe and respond to what Jesus says and does what he did. And not everyone, sadly, is willing to believe. You'd think now of all people, the Pharisees here, We often say, don't we, or we hear people say, if only I could see Jesus in the flesh and see him do a miracle, I would believe. Well, surely we think the Pharisees here, after seeing the marvel of Jesus healing and hearing the logic and the goodness and the rightness of his argument with them about the purpose of the Sabbath, 
You know that surely it's lawful to do good rather than harm, to do good and heal on the Sabbath. Surely that's the heart of God's people. Who is going to argue with that? You'd think the scales would fall from their eyes after witnessing this and hearing this. But devastatingly, we see quite a different response in verse 11. Verse 11, but they were filled with fury. Uh, That word fury there literally means an irrational, mindless, unthinking rage. It's like they put logic to sleep for a moment. Okay, reason has gone out of the door. This is a mindless fury and rage. And it says they discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. They are seething with an irrational rage of what Jesus has just said and done. Mark's parallel account again makes their intentions even clearer. Mark 3 verse 6, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The sad truth is this morning that our love of self and sin, our love of self-righteousness, our love of self-made religion is a massive idol in our hearts that we are all prone to want to hold on to and worship. It's a huge obstacle in the way of us coming empty-handed to Jesus. But at the same time, to come to Jesus and be rescued and to receive this rest and peace with God through him is as simple and as easy and as effortless as responding like this man with the withered hand. That's the thing. It's not a hard thing. Jesus isn't saying, go climb a mountain. No, it's easy and effortless. This man with the withered hand is a picture of the fact He's a picture of the fact, actually, that we can't even come to Jesus. We certainly can't come to Jesus bringing anything in our hands. We can't come in our own strength. We can't come carrying our own supposed moral and religious achievements, even if we think we've got just a few. We can't come with promises that we'll do better in the future or somehow pay God back. We can't bring any of those things. Even the very hands we try to carry those things in, if we had them, These hands are withered by sin. And so too are our hearts and our wills and our actions and all of our deeds. All of them withered by sin. Like the man here, we can't even reach out a withered hand and take hold of Jesus in our own strength. But listen again to what Jesus says to those who know they're powerless even to reach out. The same voice that spoke all creation into being says to us, stretch out your hand. And trust me. And when we hear those words from Jesus, miraculously, we stretch out our hands. We trust him. And lo and behold, he gives us new life. So all-sufficient is the, the gift of Jesus here that with a simple word, he speaks even faith, even the faith we need, into life. So if you've never done this before this morning, now is the time to hear and believe the invitation of Jesus. Stretch out your hand and ask him to rescue you and receive his forgiveness and new life. There's a wonderful verse in uh, another book of the Bible, a letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 2 verse 8, which is true of every single person who ever became a Christian, even the ones you might look at this morning and think, well, they just seem like a really good and wonderful person. No, no, no. There is no other way to be saved than this. No one has ever become a Christian that this is not true of. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is a gift. So is faith. And this morning Jesus says, believe and trust. Reach out your hands. Finally this morning, a a few more words, a few more thoughts of application for those of us who have already done this. Praise God. For those of us who are already Christians, first of all, isn't it marvelous that in Christ we have been given such a deep and abiding rest? Isn't it marvelous? It's just wonderful, isn't it? And again, we can forget this so easily, but this is the truth. We have been given eternal rest in him, an everlasting rest from ever having to worry about earning God's favor, or working for his approval, freedom and rest from a lifetime of wondering if we've ever done enough. Have I I done enough? Have I even believed enough, trusted enough? Is my faith strong enough? Jesus sets us free and gives us rest from all of those worries. Our sin was enough to condemn us forever. It's not 
No doubt of that. But Christ's finished work was enough to pardon us and rescue us forevermore. And so in Christ this morning, if you are a Christian, you have God's unending, unearned, undeserved favor. In Christ, you have, whether you feel it or not, everlasting spiritual rest. But I do want to ask you, and I want to ask myself, how much do you find yourself enjoying that rest and living in the good of that rest from day to day? Uh, what we f- whether we feel that rest doesn't change the fact we have it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't matter whether or not we're enjoying that rest. How much, perhaps the alternative, how much on the other hand do you find yourself one way or another not enjoying that rest but going back to trying to seek to earn God's approval by your works? How often do you find yourself back under the burden of legalism and experiencing the restlessness of trying to live by works? We've said it so many times because it's so important. I make no apologies for saying it again, partly, maybe even mainly because I need to hear it first and foremost. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. We need to place it before our attention, before our eyes, especially from the pages of the scriptures themselves. The incredible forgiveness and acceptance, and reconciliation that is ours with God through Christ. We need to meditate on it and massage it into our minds and hearts for God to help us do that each day, precisely because we know how prone we are to forgetting it. And we are prone, aren't we? We are so prone to forgetting this and returning to the legalistic mindset of the Pharisees. Works righteousness is still immovably hardwired into our old nature. It's still there. It's the default position of our old nature. It still tries to win us back and win us over each day. Uh, flying, flying again recently, it struck me, I don't know why this came to my mind, uh, but I was sat there wondering how much of the eight-hour flight I was on was being flown by the autopilot. Okay, I'm like, are, they, are the pilots actually doing any work up there or are we just running on autopilot? And I was thinking, is it, is it even autopilot now on takeoff? And, and when it's time for landing? Was it on during the hour or two of turbulence in the middle of the journey? Or, or were they kind of you know, grabbing the joystick controls and you know, trying to work their way through? I don't know. It didn't really bother me. I was just curious. But we can find ourselves going through a lot of daily life on autopilot too. And that should bother us. It should concern us. The problem is, while the autopilot on the plane was set for the proper destination, the old autopilot inside our hearts right now is still set to our old destination of righteousness by works. We can't ever rely on this old autopilot, unfortunately, this side of heaven. We can't rely on our hearts going in the right direction. Uh, This autopilot will not steer us to the right destination. It will always steer us away from Christ and back into legalism back into Phariseeism. We have no choice then in this present life as a Christian, therefore, to be alert and ready at the controls each day to steer ourselves back towards the grace of God in Jesus each morning and each evening and many times in between. And if it does nothing else, our passage this morning, with its stark contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees, it ought to be, excuse me, It ought to be a powerful reminder, this contrast, that there is no rest or relief or blessing whatsoever to be found in returning to living in our own strength and relating to God on the basis of our own efforts. But praise God this morning, all that we have now is given to us in Jesus and God is calling us again this morning to rest in Jesus. Not even just, not just on a Sunday morning like this, not just one day of the week, but 24-7, rest yourself in Jesus. And God also calls us to share the heart of Jesus this morning, to live ourselves, to do good, not harm to other people on all occasions, and so represent our God and Savior well. And so we might also do well to ask ourselves, do I share God's heart? Jesus' heart to do good to those in need. No matter the person, no matter the inconvenience, no matter the day or the time, do I value people like Jesus does? 
over my personal comfort, my opinions, and my preferences? And ultimately, am I a means of helping others to find true rest and peace in Jesus? Helping them to know what he said and promised. Helping them to trust in his grace and enjoy his rest. Or do I more often, and it could be for a number of reasons, whether out of fear or envy or my own lack of appreciation for grace, do I more often find myself laying more burdens and restrictions on other people than Jesus himself has or would? Or to put it another way, we might think about is the effect of my presence in my home, in the church, around my neighbors and colleagues and friends, is the effect of my presence more like that of the Pharisees or that of Jesus? Am I making burdens for people or am I relieving them? There is power for us to change here as we look again in wonder at the true heart of God toward man revealed in the person and work of Christ. The Lord's heart for us this morning is to help us in all of these things today. He's the one that's just addressed us on this and drawn our attention to these things because he loves us. This is God's heart towards us this morning. That we would go from here having found fresh relief and rest and all that we need for life and godliness in Jesus. This is God's heart. Why don't we turn now to him in prayer and seek his help. Our almighty God and heavenly loving Father, how can we thank you enough or praise you enough this morning? For the mighty and merciful, glorious and generous God you are. Father, we thank you that you are the one who gives us life and breath and every good thing. But how we thank you all the more that you're a God who even stoops down to bear our burdens. Even those burdens that we ourselves have placed upon our backs through our sin, through our self-focus, through our proclivity to legalism. Lord, we are undeserving and rebellious, and yet you have shown us mercy, sent your Son to come down and take the burden from our back. Oh Lord, we thank you again this morning for sending and sacrificing your own Son, that he did come to bear the greatest of all our burdens, to bear our sin and separation from you as he hung nailed to a cross in our place. Oh Lord, for the glory of Christ and the relief of our souls today, we pray help us to find and trust and enjoy the incomparable rest that you have given to us in Jesus. And help us, Lord, we pray, to go on fighting our legalistic tendencies with the message of your grace. And please help us, we ask, to grow in godliness by grace. Help us to be those who increasingly bear the burden, burdens of others gladly rather than lay more burdens upon their shoulders. Oh Lord, help us that we might point one another and a desperately lost and burdened world to find true life and peace and rest in Jesus. This is the prayer, Lord, we pray in the name of our Savior, the Lord of the Sabbath this morning. Amen.